I uh, just want to say welcome everybody to this webinar, Harvard Chan Sea Change Youth Summit on Climate, Equity, and Health. My name is Julian. Um, I'm a program director at Putney Student Travel, uh, and I collaborate with my colleague Sky Flanagan, who's here from Harvard Chan Sea Change, to organize this program each summer. So we're delighted you're here, and we're uh, looking forward to telling you a little bit about the program. So we're going to probably be here for we'll be going for about 30, 45 minutes, I would think. Um, I'm going to pass this off first to my colleague, Peter Shumlin, Governor Peter Shumlin, who's going to give an overview of this program, the history of it, why we're running this program now, um, and why these topics are so important. You know, from his perspective, I'll have my colleague, Sky Flanagan, who's the program manager at Sea Change, the Center for Climate, Health, and the Global Environment, talk about the center at Har their center at Harvard, uh, some highlights of this program from last summer, and what to expect for this coming summer. Um, and then I'll go and talk about the application process, scholarships, and some next steps. And we're also joined by my colleagues, Portia and Sylvie, who will be in the Q&A. We'll make sure to take a little time at the end um, to go over some of those questions that are coming up. So this webinar is being recorded, just so you know. Um, and thank you so much for coming. With that, I will pass this off to my colleague, Governor Peter Shoma. Thank you so much, Julian. It's so great to be here with you, as well as with my colleague, Sky Flanagan from Harvard Sea Change. And thanks you all for joining us. We'll try to keep the presentation closer to 30 than 45 so that we can have an opportunity for questions and answers and really have a dialogue here. But I'll just tell you very briefly how I got involved with this extraordinary program. Uh, I was, Putney was actually founded by my parents 72 years ago, and I was merrily uh, enjoying directing educational summer programs that change kids' lives. And then I think my parents instilled in me probably the same values that the applicants for Harvard Sea Chains have, which is you have to do more, particularly in this world right now, than think about yourself, your family, but you have to give back. So it was a primary, there was an open seat for governor of Vermont, Historically, this is the same time that put it in perspective that Barack Obama was running against John McCain for president. Very different time in politics, less partisan than now. And I was listening to the Democratic candidates for governor, uh, of which there were four, and they were all friends of mine, people that I knew, uh, talk about job creation. And remember, it was the bottom of the recession, world economy had fallen apart. Every politician from every country, every party was running on jobs and how you could get out of this mess that we were in. And I decided that I'd run for governor to raise issues around economic development that I really cared about. And one of them, if you flip back to that first slide, Julian, uh, back up to whoever's clip flicking. Yeah, right there. I went around Vermont and I just said, hey, if you elect me governor, one of the things we're gonna do to create jobs is to get off of oil, gas, and the current challenges we're facing in terms of uh, energy. And we're going to build out renewables like you've never seen. We're going to build solar, we're going to build wind, we're going to do energy efficiency right. And when we do that, we'll create jobs, we'll reduce power bills for Vermonters, we'll put money in your pocket, such a job creator. So I did that. I had really no chance of winning for lots of reasons that I don't explain to you, but I did win the primary. I then won the general election. And the first bill that I signed, which is the bill that you, the signing that you see here, was the energy plan and the infrastructure that we put in place, the policies that I'd outlined during the campaign. I don't, we don't have time on this webinar to sort of go into what they were. I'd be happy to take your calls or dig into that. Certainly if you join this program, I'll be talking about it at Harvard this summer. But short version is if you click the next slide, when I was done after having served three terms as governor, my wife would not let me run for a fourth. Was we, Vermont was ranked the stop, top state in the nation by the Union of Concerned Scientists uh, in terms of renewable energy growth. We had built out uh, solar, uh, four, uh, we, had, we, had, we had 11 times more solar than we did when I took office. Wind was up like 22 times. Uh, and we had made great progress moving this state towards our goal of, of energy efficiency uh, by 2050. And, and obviously meeting our climate change plan. So having said all that, uh, I put the policies in place, worked together with a great team, we really transformed the way we do things in Vermont. If you flick to the next slide, 
Uh, I then ended up, when I was governor, I worked very closely with a woman that you see here, Gina McCarthy, who was the leader of Harvard Sea Change. But before that, uh, she was she had she did many great things, including heading the EPA during the Obama administration. Gina and I had worked together very closely uh, when I was governor, and she was head of the EPA. Uh, we were good friends. She is one of the people that I admire most on this planet in terms of getting things done and cutting through the government bureaucracy to make things happen. Anyway, just by chance, I was a fellow at the uh, Harvard School of Public Health at the same time that, that Gina McCarthy was heading uh, all of Harvard's climate change uh, actions, both internally and externally, over at Harvard Sea Change with wonderful people like Sky Flanagan. And we were talking one night, and it was historically, if you flip the next slide, it was, uh, it was at the point where uh, we had pulled out of the, the, uh, the uh, climate accord Trump administration had, first thing they did. Uh, Greta was coming across to get, you know, tell them what was what at the UN, which is a speech that many of you probably remember. And Gina turned to me and said, you know, isn't it ironic? that at Harvard we're using all these extraordinary resources, some of the best in the world, the, the best thinkers, the best educators, the best innovators, to direct it all to undergraduate and graduate students. And all the action is coming from high school students right now. They're walking out of school on Friday strikes. Greta's coming over. That's the energy we want. We've got to harness that. She said, Peter, don't you work with high school students? When we're, and I said, yeah. And she said, well, let's Let's do this. We're going to do the curriculum. Harvard Sea Change is going to take the best of Harvard, the brightest that we've got, in addition to, uh, excuse me, in addition to, uh, uh, you know, the amazing resources and innovation that's happening in the Boston region. We'll bring those people in, and every student will have an action focus. That'll be their main study, but then we'll have extraordinary speakers come in, and for eight days, we're going to move the frustration that they have right now of not having the tools that we need to solve the biggest challenge that this planet has ever faced to giving them the tools that they need. And we've been doing it ever since. It's been extraordinarily successful. This is one of the programs, one of the things in life that really charges me up because we all know running out of time. We need more collaboration and information. The most likely people to save us from ourselves are you, high school students right now, who can go on forward in your careers and make this a part of your future. And that's really what this program is all about. So I'm going to turn it over to, to my colleagues, Guy Flanagan at Harvard, to talk about sort of what, what, how this program operates, why we do it, what's involved. I'll sort of click off here until uh, questions and answers. But I just want to say, of all of the things that you can do with your summer, we do this late in the summer. The students often do other things first, but we really uh, have an extraordinarily vibrant group of carefully selected students working with some extraordinary folks on what is the biggest challenge that we face as a planet and the biggest opportunity that your generation faces. So thank you so much for hearing me out and uh, I, I'll be back to you during questions and answers. Sky Flanagan is extraordinary, take it away. Thank you so much, Governor Shumlin, and, and welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, it's a real pleasure to get to share some of the highlights of our program and answer questions as we really hope that you will join us. Um, as as uh, Governor Shumlin mentioned, uh, I was brought forward this task a few years ago, um, and as we're going into our third summer now um, because we all recognized that not enough change was happening at the federal level and there was so much excitement and movement uh, happening from high school students and from younger students, younger people that are, were completely fed up with what was going on in the world and they felt very empowered to take action and they continue to do so. Um, so I'll just start by giving you a little bit of context about our center and Harvard um, and then share more about our our actual program and how it operates. Um, but uh, we are, we're really thrilled that we're back for our third summer. Um, I feel very grateful to, to the Putney team for working with us so closely on this program. Um, it's a really, really wonderful opportunity. So a little bit about our center, as you can see here, it's called the Center for Climate, Health and the Global Environment. 
Um, our center actually was founded in 1996, and we were originally based at the Harvard Medical School. Um, and we were really the first center to start to raise the alarm bells around the health impacts of climate change. Um, as a lot of you are probably aware, um, a lot of the early conversations around climate change were about melting glaciers and polar bears and far off places. And uh, some medical doctors really started to raise the alarm bells and say, listen, this is going to be impacting your children's health, your health, um, and it's, it's not about these far off places. So we were really um, at the cutting edge and we had uh, folks like John Kerry um, as advocates for starting the center. Um, and the center went through a number of different iterations. Early on, we spent a lot of our time doing congressional briefings, getting uh, politicians to understand the impacts uh, that their, their constituents were going to be facing. Um, and we moved over to the School of Public Health in, in 2013. Um, it was originally directed uh, once we moved over by uh, a fantastic professor at our school named Dr. Jack Spangler. Um, and then Gina came in um, in 2017 after leaving the Obama administration and running the EPA uh, because she recognized that the environment is not just about far off places. It's about our health and our community's health, and it's about it's about health equity. So Gina was a, was a, is a force of nature um, and has been a speaker at our summit in years past, and we hope to have her back. Um, but now we're directed by Dr. Ari Bernstein. He um, is a pediatrician by training, so he cares for children on a daily basis at Boston Children's Hospital. And he is a fantastic um, voice in the climate and health space. He wrote one of the first early on books on the subject and continues to be very vocal around the health impacts of climate change. And uh, we're really lucky because our director, uh, Dr. Bernstein, gets to work with us the whole week of the summit. So he's there every single day working with the students um, and helping them understand uh, some of these uh, direct uh, impacts of health, health impacts of climate change. So we're, we're very lucky that we have him involved. And I wanted to walk through some of the other type of speakers that we have uh, that in years past and will likely be back this summer because we not only pull from the Harvard community of professors um, and faculty, we also bring in youth activists and we bring in health communicators and various different folks that uh, we, we feel really strongly about have uh, a lot to offer to young people. So I already spoke a little bit about Dr. Ari Bernstein. And just to give you an example of some of the other types of speakers you might see, um, you know, Jerome Foster, if you're unaware of him, make sure you are aware of him. He is the youngest member of the White House Environmental Justice Advisor. He actually is a Putney alum as well. Um, he came and spoke a couple of years ago. We have Francesca Dominici, who is probably the, one of the leading data scientists in the world, one of the most well-published authors, uh, well-published professors, and she's just a force of nature herself. People like Marcia Castro, who uh, leads a department at our School of Public Health and is an expert in infectious diseases, um, and, and folks like Howie Frumkin, who has been a dean at the School of Public Health at University of Washington and has led massive foundations um, and is really on the cutting edge of discussing hope when it comes to climate change. I, I, I didn't really get to mention it in the beginning, but I wanted to, to mention it now that one of the one of the things that we at our center strive to highlight is not is to not put climate change only through the doom and gloom um, lens because we all know that that doesn't spur action. So we we spend a lot of our time uplifting climate solutions and making sure that people feel uh, that there are tangible ways that they can take action on climate change. Some of the other folks that we've had um, and will continue to be involved uh, are people like Dr. Howard Coe. He was the Assistant Secretary of Health in the Obama administration and is now a, a faculty member at the school. Um, Renee Salas is an emergency medicine doctor and is the lead author on the Lancet Countdown on Climate and Health. 
She is uh, constantly in the news speaking about these connections and the way that the medical community can step up to take action. Um, and then we have folks like Jeff Nesbitt, who is probably the most influential person you've never heard of. He is a climate communicator and uh, I believe he is currently holding a government position, uh, but he is one of the people that led a lot of the a lot of the movement behind the tobacco campaign and getting raising awareness around that um, and has been very influential in climate and health. And of course, we have Governor Shumlin come speak who, uh, you were able to hear a little bit about his background, but he is a very dynamic individual and uh, we have a lot to thank him for. So these are just a sampling of the type of guest speakers that we bring in throughout the week. Um, and uh, that is supported by some of our amazing instructors. So these are the folks that are going to be with the kids and the students the entire week. So we have people like Christina Arminger, Arminger who is a professor, a faculty member at Vermont Academy throughout the year. And she is going to be back for her third summer. Um, we're really grateful. She is the boots on the ground director, knows, knows how to work with all different student dynamics, super supportive. Um, and then we have other instructors, uh, some of them listed here that have expertise in environmental justice and epidemiology and policy um, and folks that you know are just there to support and make sure that the students have an outlet if they need to talk about any type of issue that they're having on the ground or any kind of idea that they need. Um, so some of them are listed here, but we have uh, a staff of around 25 generally um, and it is a fantastic wealth of knowledge. So a little bit more about this summer's program and the way it works. Um, and as Pete mentioned, we're happy to answer any specific questions at the end, but I wanted to just walk you through sort of like what that, what a week would look like. Uh, so this, so this summer we're, we're running the program from July 22nd to July 29th. It's a Saturday to Saturday. So the, the students will come in on a Saturday um, they have Sunday to get acquainted, spend some time getting to know the city, um, getting to know their group, and uh, starting Monday morning, they kick off with a number of different guest lectures, uh, workshops, etc. Uh, it is offered from grades 9 to 12, and our theme this year is turning knowledge into climate action. So as students enroll in our program, they pick one action focus. That is the lens in which they uh, view all of the content and their, their particular group uh, gets to learn about the climate issues. So, you know, we have everything from a climate communications press and media group to a policy and advocacy group, um, climate science, entrepreneurship, environmental justice, global health, medicine and healthcare. These are all uh, supposed to be geared towards what the students would like to follow up and, and learn a little bit more about. They're, of course, going to learn about each one of these things throughout the week. But, um, you know, if someone was really interested in understanding climate policy and how they might imp uh, implement a climate uh, action plan within their local community, they might want to start, uh, they might want to enroll in the climate um, advocacy policy action focus group. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So when students come into the program, they pick, um, or excuse me, once once they pick their action focus group, and that is the group that they they work with throughout the week. They have an instructor. Or they they really that's you know their core bubble that they get to spend time with. Um, and we wanted to make sure that every student walked away from this program with some sort of thing that they could take back into their community. So throughout the week, um, each student uh, works on a community action plan. We've had everyone, everything ranging from students uh, proposing solar in their community to installing a greenhouse, a greenhouse at their school so they can grow better food um, to you name it. There's, there's, it's, it's really up to the student to come up with what they feel will make an impact in their hometown and what they're passionate about. So 
I just got a, an email a couple of days ago from a student that was very passionate about uh, e-waste in his community. And this student actually was from Australia and he has lobbied the Australian parliament to implement a law to ban e-waste from just going into, uh, into the landfill. So um, it's a really, really great way for them to take action and take what they learn back into their community. So throughout the week, um, you know, I shared some of the guest speakers we have, but throughout the week, we have a nice mix of um, activities that the students take part in. So we have everything, each day they will, they'll have some sort of uh, guest speaker that they hear from, and then they'll also have workshops and other activities. Uh, here you can see a student working, um, doing a workshop with one of our local pharmaceutical companies. Uh, our biotech, they, her, her presentation was on green chemistry, and she was uh, doing a demonstration of, uh, with, uh, with the student. And so that's like a fun way to, to integrate some of the knowledge that they're learning from the other parts of the program. And our, our school, uh, the School of Public Health, and the medical school and the, the dental school at Harvard are all located um, in the Longwood medical area. So, so while most of Harvard is known for being in Cambridge, um, our school is actually based in Boston. So you stay at a dorm in uh, just, just adjacent to our school. Um, and uh, all of our classes and guest speakers are held at the School of Public Health, which I mentioned is in Boston. But of course, being a Harvard program, we feel very strongly that we want to make sure that students get over to Cambridge and get to experience the Cambridge vibe. So we spend um, at least one afternoon uh, on the Harvard quad. We uh, lead, a, we have a student led tour. So, so at that point, our students are able to talk to real Harvard college students to ask them questions about what it's like to be there and really get to know that, that part of Harvard, which is, uh, is a very uh, highly visited place. It's actually one of the top tourist destinations in the world. Um, it's, a beautiful, it's a beautiful space. And we spend an afternoon there with, with doing a tour, checking out some of the museums. And as I mentioned, speaking to some of the Harvard College students. So on top of those type of activities, we also make sure that we wanna have students have fun so uh, we, we have uh, offerings of morning yoga or uh, running clubs. Um, you know, students are oftentimes found, uh, they, they organize soccer on the quad or whatnot. And then we uh, take them at least one day uh, to, to, on a kayaking tour of, of Boston, which if you have not done before is probably one of the best ways to see the city. It's, it's just a beautiful view of Boston on one side and Cambridge on the other. And it's always a highlight of the trip. So it is a, uh, it's a, it's a jam packed week, but um, we certainly uh, make time for community building as that's one of the most important elements that I've seen come out of this program is that a lot of students come into this program feeling alone in the climate movement. And by the end, they really feel like they have a network of, um, of peers that are also really passionate about um, these issues. And that way they can, they can move them forward. I've been personally extremely inspired by these students. Um, we had a student last summer that joined up with another student over the summer and they started a nonprofit that is installing solar panels on schools in Africa. Um, other students that are writing for their local newspaper now on climate and health issues. Um, and other students that are running for office. One of our students was the youngest, um, youngest person to be running for office in the state of Michigan for state health office. So it is, um, it is a really, really dynamic group of individuals that come to this program. Um, and we, we work really hard to make sure that it's uh, well represented from all over the country and world. I think we had 25 states that were there last year and nine countries that came. Um, and we, we offer scholarships, which I, uh, my colleague Julian will go into more depth with, but we, uh, it, is a, it is one of our favorite things that we get to do, um, our center gets to do because 
these are the leaders of the next generation and we will do everything in our power to make sure that they feel supported and that they have the resources and toolkit they need to make a change in their community and and hopefully steer their path in the direction of of climate public health medicine industry all of these things that that we need we need leaders that that understand the intersection so um with that i'll pause um i'll stop and pass it back over to co my colleague julian and then um pete and i will jump back on at the end to answer questions so thank you so much thank you sky that was a fantastic overview um so i'm just going to touch briefly on the application process and next steps. Um, I just wanted to first say, if you have any questions about the program, you can call our office at Putney Student Travel. It's, it's easy to remember, 802-387-5000, ask for Julian, and I'd be happy to walk you through the program, uh, the schedule, the instructors you know we, we've hired for this year, some of the speakers that we know are coming already, Any anything that's coming up for you, I'd love to chat with you about it. Um, so the application is pretty straightforward. You can go to our website, which is you go to goprecollege.com and you'll find the Harvard Chan Youth Summit there. Uh, and you can start an online application. The whole thing is online. Uh, we ask for a personal statement, two teacher references, um, and we ask families to sign an agreement form. And we also require a deposit to hold your space on the program while you're finishing up the rest of the application. So all of that is online and it's, it's very straightforward. Um, with that And then we also have a scholarship program, which you can learn about on the website too. Uh, it's pretty, it's also online, but it's a completely separate process. So you'll fill out uh, an online Google form and you'll submit some paperwork um, and we have full and partial scholarship funding available. Uh, so tell your friends, uh, tell everybody you know, we, uh, it's a fantastic program and we love um, getting students to join from all over the place. It really enhances the dynamic and creates a really rich uh, network of peers and future leaders. So let's see if we have anything in the Q&A. Looks like- Hello, um, we do oh, have Portia. a few questions. Hey, so thank you to the presenters. That was great. We do have a few questions. Um, the first one is, can rising ninth graders apply or only if they have completed ninth grade? We, uh, it's gener the program is generally intended for students completing ninth through 12th grade, but we do accept some rising ninth graders uh, who are motivated and really convey, you know, a sense of wanting to be there and, and wanting to participate. And so they sometimes have a little bit more involved in the application process, but it's, we definitely welcome applications from motivated uh, rising ninth graders. Great. Um, second question is, do you have scholarships? Yes, we do. If you go to our website, uh, you can read all about the scholarship eligibility criteria and start the online application uh, right there. Great. If I can just add something to what Julian just said, one of the, there are a lot of really great things about this program. Uh, the first and probably the foremost is was Gina's vision of giving high school students access to people and resources that normally they would never have access to through Harvard's connections and the rest. But I think the second piece is it, and, and Sky alluded to this, this is a group of students from across the country and the world uh, who have a common purpose. And in that vein, it's incredibly important that it be a group of students who are from different backgrounds, different countries, different uh, uh, experiences in life, and economic as well as all diversity is really important to us. So you will find that you're with a group of students that is really unlike the group of students that you probably you know, hang out with every day at school. Uh, different interests, different backgrounds, and uh, very, very engaged in this mission. So, you know, I always say for students, oh, wait, oh, is it debating whether or not climate change? No, definitely not. We don't have time for that. This is for students who are committed to action and need the resources to take it. All right, we're getting a lot of questions pouring in. And just a reminder, if we don't get to them today, you can always give us a call. Um, so the next question is, 
what are the application deadlines or milestones? And when do you inform families of acceptance? So we have a rolling application, uh, which is open. It opens in the fall um, and it goes until the program is full. We are having a very busy enrollment season this year. So we're starting, we're getting a lot of interest. Um, and so we definitely encourage you to start an application sooner than later. As I think this program filled up um, in early spring last year. So we definitely recommend applying now and getting started with all of that. Uh, but it is a rolling process and we, the, it's a pretty quick uh, admissions process. Okay, great. And then we've got lots of questions about how many students will be selected, how many students usually participate in the program each year. Yeah, so uh, we will accept up to 120 students for the summit. Um, and we, for housing, we, we take over this beautiful dorm building, uh, which is run by Massachusetts College of Art and Design. It's called the Treehouse Residence. You can look it up. It's a beautiful, uh, kind of a skyscraper in Boston with an amazing view of the city. Um, and we pair students by their self-identified gender um, in rooms of two. Uh, and we take over basically the top half of the building. So yeah, we will expect up to 120 students or so. I, I think it's worth mentioning because parents often ask, how come you're not in Harvard housing? And the answer is, think about it for a minute. We're on, as Sky mentioned, the Boston side of the river, which I love because you're right next to the Isabel Gardner Museum. You're right next to the, very close to the uh, Museum of Art. I mean, it's like, it's, a, it's more like a neighborhood, great little restaurants. And, you know, it feels less sort of uh, isolated than Harvard Square, in my view. Having said that, um, the medical school, the School of Pharmacy, Public School, the Harvard Public School of Health, and uh, Dental School, they all share the same little campus there. And obviously, they don't have a lot of dormitories because graduate students, they have apartments, they live out in the real world. So we're grateful and lucky to have the Mass College of Art dormitory, which is literally a 10 minute walk across maybe three or four city blocks to the Harvard School of Public Health and the medical school. Awesome. Okay. Um, last question, I believe. Um, or nope, we've got a couple more. So is there a pickup or drop off service from the airport or do parents need to fly and bring students to campus? Um, I can answer that one quickly. Parents definitely do not have to bring students to campus. We use Boston's Logan Airport. We have a whole travel team here that helps coordinate that transportation. When your student lands at Logan, we know exactly what plane they're coming in on. They have contact information of the person waiting outside of security for them. In 72 years, we haven't lost a student yet at an airport. We're not starting, planning to start this summer. And the tuition includes everything to get you from Logan to our program and back to Logan at the end of the program. So we have students flying in from foreign countries all over the world. Uh, but the answer is if you fly into Logan, we take it from there. One other thing I'll just add is once a student is accepted, every student who's accepted uh, is able to access what we call the digital locker, which is where we store, a we share a packing list, we share travel information and guidelines for booking travel. Um, we share a whole bunch of reading and media resources that are that are from past years, but also updated every year with new new resources from Harvard. And um, so we provide a lot of materials to, to students and families before the program starts. I think it's also just met, worth mentioning because I don't think it's come up yet from either Sky or correct me if I'm wrong, Sky uh, and Julian, but this is a super busy program. Like I think parents sometimes think, you know, you go to your action focus and then you'll go to a lecture and then you sort of sit around and God knows do what. Uh, the bottom line is we're going from the minute we get up in the morning until literally 11 o'clock at night. There is so much to get done in the days that you don't have enough time. It doesn't mean we don't go off and have some fun. Of course we do. But this is not a program for folks who don't have the stamina to really give it their all, number one. And number two, don't worry about not having friends, being isolated in your room, wondering what to do, lonely and lost. That, hasn't, that doesn't happen. You're going to make some of the closest personal connections you've made. There's a real camarad camaraderie of, of the spirit that, that by the end of this program. And you are busy as can be. You don't have time to be texting back to friends and doing all this. You know, you're, this is a very engaging and carry your, a carefully choreographed program, but it takes everything you've got. 
All right, great. And we had one other ask about if the recording will be available, which it will be on our website within the next couple of days. I believe if you've RSVP, then you will also get a link to that recording in your email. That's all. Portia, did we introduce you? I can't remember. We did not. Okay. Yeah, Portia Watson is, is the rock star here and helps to make all this magic happen. So thanks for your help. And I think Silly Littledale is somewhere in the background there helping us too. So thanks team for all that you're doing. Listen, I just wanna close by saying, uh, if there's no more questions, uh, if you have questions that you don't wanna ask in a forum like this, Sky and Julian and Portia and I love talking about this program. So just call and ask for us. We will answer any questions, concerns that you have. But I just want to say that, you know, as we see what's happening on the planet and we see how fast it's happening and how little time we have left to significantly change the course that we're on, this particular program is more important in my view than anything that high school students could be doing. So it's not to suggest that there aren't other great things to do in the summertime. I really do hope if you're fired up about this issue, that you'll consider making this a part of your summer. And finally, don't wait or slam with applications. And as Julian mentioned, it's a rolling admissions process. So if you're thinking, yeah, this is something I wanna do, just go online, fill out the form. The first stage is take seven minutes. You fill out the basic information, you make a $700 deposit on Visa or MasterCard or Discover. We write back and say, yes, we have space and we have space in your action focus or no, we don't we figure it out from there. But if we do, then you go through admissions process, but we hold your space while you go through admissions. We don't give it your space to someone who applies after you, but whose teachers might be more prompt in getting back to us or whose essay comes in sooner. So in other words, once we acknowledge space, the only reason we wouldn't take you is if we thought you weren't appropriate for the program. And then we refund your $700 deposit and go forward from there. So that's the process. If you have questions, call us. Uh, we, uh, we're passionate about this program because we're running out of time. Thank you for coming, everybody. And I uh, hope to talk to you sometime soon. Thanks, Adios. everyone. Hope to see you in the summer.